Okay. Hey, Pertu, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. What about you? Yeah, really, really good, thanks. It's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast because you are the first guest on the podcast, episode number 72, uh, from Finland. This is this is a big, big step um, for the podcast. I'm going, going very international now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a big step, right? Hmm. <laughs> But you do a lot of you do a lot of work outside of Finland, though, don't you? Like we were saying before you hit record, before we hit records, you're doing a talk in Kazakhstan, right? Like, and that that that's pretty that's pretty far away from Finland. <laughs> yeah, and, and in Austria the week after, and you know, after COVID, um, it's been a bit basically just online. But I think now the world is recovering a bit, and now I've started to have these gigs abroad as well, which is wonderful because I think it's it's the first time in like two years that is happening so mm. what i do i give keynotes i talk about the future and i've written a couple of books about it and um, i'm very keen on, on on those topics so that's usually what they ask me to talk about when, when there are some events in finland or uh, abroad mm. so you go you go to these events like expos and stuff like that and like keynotes to be a keynote speaker so what sort of stuff do you talk about so future of work is a big topic um i've given probably hundreds of lectures about that uh disruption and exponential technology is another one future of education and future skills um is a big one also identity and and how humans and computers can cooperate and then after covid i've also talked about change you know what kind of things slow us down so Mm. what kind of hurdles to overcome in order to make a positive change in our our routines and our habits and the environment is, of course, one that is present in pretty much everything I do. So, yeah. um, possibility, and you know, I think when I started out, it was one subject. It was like innovation, disruption, and the future in general. But it has like grown. It has grown quite a lot. And my first book, Future Skills, was about future skills. So that that kind of became um, on my on my repertoire. And then work, and it has kind of expanded naturally. So I, I really enjoy when I can paint the big picture. Like, where are we going as a human? Like, what yeah. kind of society do we want? What's the role of technology in our lives? And asking these big questions. Yeah, I love stuff like that, and I always get fascinated by people that are like actually professional speakers because they they know one topic very very well, and it sounds like you know your topic very very well, which is which is amazing, I guess. This is the thing, though. Whenever I talk to speakers, it's always quite funny about how they got into it. It's never really like it's, there's never really one set sort of route, is it? It's like it's it, no one's got this one sort of proven formula to get to being a, a speaker. Like I'd I'd be interested to see like how you got into it. Yeah, you know, and I think you cannot become a speaker by first thinking, "Oh, I'm gonna become a speaker." Like it, it's the same with entrepreneurship. Like you should have the drive. You should have the passion. Like you should have a message you want to share. And then if really the message resonates and people think like, oh, this really makes me think, then you kind of get more gigs and then you kind of become a speaker. But I think it all starts with like, why do you want to do it? Do you just want to do it because you want to be a speaker, like have the title? Or do you just feel the urgent need to be out there and, Tell people what you what you think, and so I think it's important to really ask what motivates, you know, me. What what is important for me, and, and for me, it was never the fact. That, okay, I'm gonna get a microphone and a big spotlight, and people are gonna yeah, be yeah. listening to me, like all that fancy stuff. No, but I I felt like I, I there are things that I haven't heard talked about. Like there's something that hasn't is not being discussed enough in my opinion, and I want to bring that. Um, to people like I want to bring my approach and my kind of worldview and then have a discussion with people so mm. it has to start with um like passion yes yeah exactly I'd love to find out I guess how like how did your whole journey begin because I we we talked about it before we hit record it's a very interesting story and it, you started very very young like we've obviously this this podcast focuses on young entrepreneurs but when we when we go into the world of like teenage entrepreneurs, it's like it's pretty crazy to me. So I, that's where it started for you. Yes, and you know, I never intended to become an entrepreneur. I never actually even considered it. There are no entrepreneurs in my 
like families in my close circle. So I, I never saw the example and I, I, I actually didn't thought, think that I would become an entrepreneur, but it kind of happened. So when I was 15, um, I was struggling with music theory. I wanted to become a composer, but if you want to compose music, you need to understand theory very well. But I had a hard time with it. So I felt like, well, I need to find some ways to explain it to myself. Like I, I need to create some tools or some something to help myself. And when I was 15, I, I came up with this idea that if we put these notes, these 12 notes we had in music, into a clock, you know, in a circle, um, we would have this music clock and you could present scales and chords and, and, and intervals and different music theory, you know, stuff in this visual form and it helped me a lot and i got into university studying music theory and composition this way and it then became into a product and into a company it got patented and won some awards and it kind of just happened but again it all started with a passion like i want to mm. make it easier for myself and then at some point i figured out well it might help other people as well so why, why, why won't i just share my idea so i think uh, my life in general, like it, it, it would have been very difficult to like plan um, this career path that I've had. You know, I started with music. I, I went to study composition. I'm an, I'm an artist. I'm a composer by heart, I guess. But then I became an entrepreneur at a very young age. And then I got to Silicon Valley where I was studying technology and, and the future. And then I got to Myanmar where I co-founded a project there. And, and you know, so I think I've been lucky, obviously, and I've been available. I think those are the two things. When mm. an opportunity has been there, then I've thought, well, let's try it. Let's see where it goes. Mm. And I think the most important thing when I was young, 15, is that I took the step. You know, I, I, I gave my, like, I experienced. I wanted to show my people, like my friends, this idea, and I was a bit afraid of that. Like, what if they think it's 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 very bad and it doesn't work yeah. or whatever? But what that taught me is that every t- every time you take a leap of faith in this way, um, it usually pays off. So yeah. that's kind of yeah. how everything got started. Let's talk about, I guess, like, there's a lot of different things in that answer that you gave, but let's let's talk let's talk about the, I guess, the invention a little bit, just just for a bit of context. So. I I'm not into music or service so this sort of stuff I don't really know but I obviously I know about business and that sort of thing so what what is it was it an actual physical invention was it actually like a, a clock with different music notes on on the on the 12 on the 12 bits yes so actually I, I made the first prototype out of cardboard so I, I I like cut it down and um so two plates or kind of wheels that you rotate against each other and in these holes that are in the wheels, um, you can see certain notes that belong to a scale. I think this is very difficult to explain, but when you see it visually, like you get it in, in, like immediately. So may, maybe I wouldn't go further trying to explain, but basically it's a tool that visualizes music theory and helps you grasp it. Normally when you teach it on book pages and you know on, on the traditional means, um, it might be difficult to understand the patterns mm. and, and the kind of mathematics behind it. It's very simple at the end of the day, but it's been presented in a way that is kind of difficult. So I just kind of took it and gave it a different form and w- realized that this way many people understand in a second these concepts. Like many people, for many people, the visual form is just a bit easier to grasp. Mm. So... Um, so, so that's basically what I did. Mm. I, I took this hundreds of years old tradition <laughs> and tried to like explain it in a visual way. Yeah. And that really helped you obviously learn, learn the music composition and stuff like that. And then you thought it would help other people. And so how did that kind of, especially cause you were 15 as well, that, that, that's phenomenal to me. How did it go from that, that cardboard cutout to scaling it, to getting it in people's hands, to patent it, to, like patenting it? How did all that stuff happen? Yeah. Well, actually, for the first two, three years, nothing happened. So when I was 15, I was very excited. Okay, I have this wonderful idea. And I sent it to a couple of composers and a couple of professionals. Like, hey, look what I've I've created. And they were like, well, this is wonderful. It works. It really works. And it's, it's splendid. 
But again, they didn't have any advice from like, they weren't business people. And I didn't yeah. have any business people around me. So there was nobody to help me forward. Like at 15, 16, you don't like know what to do. Like I, I, that was completely new for me. So I, I wasn't expecting it to become anything. It was just my, my hobby. But then there was this uh, competition at high school, uh, like national competition for new ideas, innovations. And um, I saw that and I felt like, well, I have an idea in my oops, back pocket. Oh, sorry. Um, so I felt like I, I have this idea in my back pocket, so I'll send it. And um, I did, and I won the competition. Uh, and that kind of started the, the, the snowball effect. So then there were professionals, like like people who told me that you might want to patent this invention. And then we got funding, we created an, an app around it, and one thing led to another. But the beginning was actually difficult. Like I didn't know what to do, and mm. and, and only until like professionals helped me. Mm. So what happened to that business in the end? Like what what was the what was the end? Or I guess is it still going? It's still going. I mean, uh, obviously, I don't have that much time to put into it because I'm doing all these keynotes and books and and, and that. But it's on App Store. You can you can like download it. You can uh, buy it, and and it's, it's very nice actually to get messages from people around the world. You know, music teachers, for example, who are like, "Hey, this is helpful. Like, I'm using this with my students." And hmm. so it's it's there. And and um, obviously, music theory is not the ten x business. Like, <laughs> it, it's quite niche. But yeah, still, yeah. It, it it solves the problem it was intended to solve. And and I think I'm very grateful for that. That's that's a lovely. Je- I mean, that, yeah, the sentiment is definitely real. When you when you, you want to solve a problem as an entrepreneur, right? And you, you solved it so well that even now when you're not putting that much time into it, the product is still solving problems well enough that these teachers are continuously messaging you. Like for me, like that that is the best feeling. Like more than, more than the money size, people actually messaging you and saying like, this this is amazing. I love this. This is or like, this is like changed my students' life. This has changed my life. That, that, that That's probably the best feeling for me as an entrepreneur. Yeah, and I think that was one of the main reasons why I made the change from from music to entrepreneurship. Mm. Because when I composed a song, a piece of music, um, it might be that it really touched somebody. You know, yeah. really, it was very important and very beautiful, and they they got emotional by listening it. But as a composer, I would never know. <laughs> like yeah, I didn't yeah, get yeah. any data back. Like, it's somewhere there, my my composition, but. I don't know really what impact I've made or have I. And as an entrepreneur, it's nice kind of to know that, okay, I know exact amount of like, I know how many apps they've uploaded or sorry, downloaded or like how many people are using it or where is it? And Mm, yeah, I think both are about making an impact. But one is very, abstract like uh, and, and one is very concrete and i mm. think at some point i made a decision that i i like to be able to kind of know what i've been able to do like where the where the results are so yeah. um that's that's why i felt like entrepreneurship is for me mm. that that's yeah I, I completely agree with you and it's it's so nice to hear that and i think what we should move on to now is i guess how did you end up in silicon valley and i guess like what did you learn there when you went yeah. Well, again, I saw this. This um, like they, they, they. I saw a message saying that there is this. Um, there is this course in Silicon Valley where they teach you about exponential technologies and future and global grand challenges, um, and I got very excited when I when I read it and I felt like, well, I want to know. Like, uh, I'm gonna apply, and um, I got in, which was. A miracle because it was quite yeah. a long process and i was only 21 at the time and, and that was the like lowest age that they even you know took people in so i got this chance to go to silicon valley and and i i was among like geniuses and people who were older than me and, and, and wiser than me and i learned a lot from them and it was a very important experience for me because it kind of opened my eyes to what to expect from the coming years and it really inspired me to to do something, you know, um, kind of that entrepreneurial spirit, that Silicon Valley mindset really yeah. um, did the trick. 
but obviously later I also was able to challenge it a bit. Like not, it's not everything. Everything is not that black and white, you know. Yeah. But but still, yeah. um, it it got me do something, and that's the most important thing, I guess. Um, so I met this this uh, friend from the same course from Myanmar, and we both had passion to education. So we felt like, well, let's try to do something together. And we started a project. I helped her. And, and we went to Myanmar, she took the helm, like she, she has all the knowledge and I don't even know the language, so I was only helping from afar. But still, I got a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge um, working, um, or, or at least uh, like following what's happening over there. And after that, I felt like, well, I've seen two opposites, like I've seen Silicon Valley, which is one end of spectrum, but then the developing nation Myanmar has mm. its own challenges. And... In Finland, in Europe, we are somewhere in the middle. And I want to share what I've learned from my trip, from my my projects. So I got back to Finland and I felt like, well, I, I, I want to tell people what I've learned. And I gave a first keynote. I got good reviews. I gave a second one. And little by little, I got more and more of those. Mm. And it became my kind of full day job. Now I start a new company for myself only, my personal brand. and and what I do, I do all kinds of projects related to future. Um, so that's kind of, I, I, be, I went from, you know, a, a composer mm. to a grand inventor to a future geek to a nonprofit founder in a developing nation to a speaker to an author. So I, I've never done any of these, mm. but trying to achieve, you know, a title or trying to achieve a name like I want to do this just so that they can call me uh, with certain yeah. name. Um, but rather, I've been just curious, I guess, and interested in, in, in all of these things. And, and it has led me to very different, well, places yeah. around the world. Um, but I think coming to the point that we, I think we met earlier is that we shouldn't be that con- that kind of focused on, on, on what the title or what the what they call us um, rather what what sparks uh, like what, what what motivates you what what gives you joy what makes you tick um, so so I've just followed that basically in my life mm. yeah no I love that and I think I think it would be it'd be amazing for me to know this but I'd like against the audience as well is that obviously you started a business within Finland uh, which is obviously like one of the is is very well developed nation. Then you went to Silicon Valley, which is you know the the pretty much even even now like the heart of and the engine of startups, right? Um, mm. And I know I know some people are are fairly critical of Silicon Valley. Not not all the lessons that they teach there are applicable everywhere. Which which I think they'd like to think that exactly. they'd like to think that it is. Um, I actually spoke to a Harvard M- MBA professor who he was saying a similar thing that you're saying like they there's a lot of things that they get wrong but what i would love to know is obviously you obviously from those different experiences and then obviously starting a business within a developing nation there must be so many differences with starting a business in you know very well established developed nations compared to mm-hmm. developing nations yes you know one thing that i noticed quite soon is that in Silicon Valley, they, they really believe that technology will solve our problems. And, and the better you understand the technology, the better the, te- the technology becomes, the better chances we have at, at solving these grand challenges. And in Myanmar, I, 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 or in general, later, I, I realized that, that you cannot solve all the problems with technology. <laughs> like, it doesn't solve everything. So we need other things as well. And then comes to culture, it comes to tradition, history, mm. and so on. Um, so obviously, um, it was very different to um, to to see what's happening in Myanmar, how, how everything is going. And and one thing that I learned from there is that when you start, let's say we take education as an example in Myanmar, it's quite. Um, let's say it this way: there's a lot of work to do. Uh, the army coup has been censoring and controlling the scene for like 50 years and so and, and th- there's a lot of legwork to be done so when you have this situation you're quite open to new things you know all the new innovations new ideas 
you take them in because there's nothing to lose. Yeah. When you're kind of you have such a bad system in place, then you can be quite open with new ideas. Well, whereas in Finland, for example, or other developed nations where you have a good system in place, let's say education in Finland is, is world world known. Um, so the thing over here is that we have so much to lose. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't want to take the risk or try the new thing. Yeah. Because what if it's worse? And what ends up happening is that we become very, very careful doing things. We we don't take risks, we don't we're not courageous enough. And in this way there is something that a developing nation can teach developed nation about innovation. So it was a big lesson for me to kind of realize that even though we're doing well, it shouldn't slow us down. Even though things are working right now, it's not a guaranteed, uh, like it's not a guarantee that in the future we would still be well off. So kind of a reminder that don't get too comfortable, Mm. (laughs) you know, enjoy that you're doing well, of course, but um, still have to move forward. Yeah, 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 of course. I'd love to, because we've only got a bit of time left, I'd love to talk about, I guess, how you transitioned from all of that to becoming a speaker. Because as I mentioned before, like at the very start of the episode, it's very like, there's no proven track. There's no proven sort of like path to becoming a speaker. So after you finished in Myanmar and you came back to Finland, what was the sort of like, what was the sort of step there? Mm. Well, as I said, I had this huge need urgent need to go and tell people what i've learned mm. but obviously i had no name i wasn't a celebrity like nobody knew me so i had to work my way up so i contacted one of these speaking agencies and and told them that hey like give me a chance i'm gonna like like can you find me a gig yeah and they did and they got the first gig and and Little by little, when how, I got how more soon, recognition, sorry to interrupt you. How, how soon after, like you contacted them, did they did they get it that first gig? I think it was a month or two. Okay. Yeah, it probably it was March when I kind of went to their office and and gave them a like a short keynote to kind of give a preview, and it was May when I got the first gig. Um, mm. And I think the first fall, then I had like maybe 20 or so. Then the next fall, more and more. And, and like the year before COVID, I had 196 <laughs> in oh eight different God. countries. So it kind of organically, though, it, it just grew. And, um, and, and so basically, it has to go that way if you are not a big name, you know, what you need to have is you need to have substance, like something really worth saying, like something interesting, something um, that is different maybe in some ways. And when you do a lot of keynotes, you become a better, you can be better at speaking. And when you become better at speaking, people start to know you by name. And it kind of, these are the steps mm. that usually happen. And of course, in the beginning, I did a lot of keynotes for free and, and, and underpaid, but then, as people start to see that, okay, this guy knows his stuff, then I was able to kind of uh, ask, ask for, for a prize as well. Um, mm. and, and it became now my full day job. So mm. it doesn't mean that it, it, it happened easily or, you know, every time I kind of go through the history and, and my path, it, it all sounds like, oh, this just all went so smoothly. And, and obviously there were challenges and there were, upsides and downsides and, and and not every gig is perfect but um but i always wanted to become better and i think that is mm. really what what set me apart i've never gone to any like speaking like i've never had a coach i've never gone to any courses where they like tell you how to present and speak i've just yeah they they threw me into cold water and i had to kind of be able to swim so i've mm. learned just by doing and and really experience is a good teacher so just mm. go on out there and, and do as much as you can i think would be my advice yeah do you remember your first paid gig yes it was this um uh, oh my gosh how do you explain it in english it's uh, <laughs> uh 
this one community. It's not a city, but a smaller one, uh, like like a town. In a whole, whole, yeah, like a town. It was a town hall with a like couple of maybe like thirty people in it, and I talked about I think creativity and my story, and um, I, I still remember the the gig. Um, but we all start from somewhere, so exactly. that was my start. Well, it, like it started with thirty people. How many people do you speak in front of now? Obviously, before before COVID, when the crowds were were at their peak. Yeah, well, I think one of the biggest seminar places in Finland. It's like sixteen hundred people, wow. and I've I've been there a couple of times when the when the hall is full. So that's that's pretty cool. But I've also done now remote gigs in some like cellar um, where there's just the lens, the camera. And me talking, but it goes to like two thousand people. Yeah, so it's yeah. like a pity. Like I don't see any of you, but there's a lot of you guys. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's a pity. But I mean, the the energy the that you get there. when you step on the stage and there are people and yeah. the when a thousand people people are you know, silent together, it's incredible. Mm. Like the, the the electricity in the, in the place. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm really like, I wish we could get back to those mm. events soon. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely with you. So, I think we're gonna have to end it there, Peretu, because we're yeah, it's coming up towards the end. But I I love to have you on the podcast. It was such an amazing experience. I've, we've we've had quite a few speakers on the podcast before. I always love enjoying hearing their stories because, as I mentioned to you, there's no sort of one path. People have so many different experiences, and your experience is very cool because I haven't had a composer on the podcast before. I've had I've had someone who's who's like <laughs> professional ballet, but I've not had a composer. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool to have you on the podcast. How can people stay in touch with you and also what you're doing? I know you've got a couple books out at the moment, so yeah, it'll be good to know how people can find you. Yeah. I think one of the best ways to dig, like dig deeper into my, my thinking and my, my ideas is to read the book because there's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. It's called future skills. And I could say, well, my website, I have a difficult name, so I, I think I have to type it, but it's P-E-R-T-T-U-P-O-L-O-N-E-N.com. So my first name and last name. Um, and of course, on Instagram, uh, I always love to see like who, who is following and what kind of thoughts they have and, you know, mm. just interact. So uh, I, I think those will do. Okay, sweet. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. I'm sure we'll chat soon. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much.